And the title of my message this morning is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. The title of the message this afternoon is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and today and forever. And that we find that in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And the purpose of the message is, uh, you know, to, to just, it's a good reminder as to who Jesus is. And God gives us uh, here in his word in Hebrews uh, seven verses that lead up to verse 8. And I just think it's interesting, um, the more and more I study the Bible, one of my favorite things about the Bible is when it just seems like God throws a verse in the middle of uh, Scripture that maybe we would not put in there. And so, I mean, he's talking about brotherly love and entertaining angels unaware and being bound with them that are bound and marriage is honorable and all and your conversation without covetousness. And, and you know, he's talking about being boldly, uh, and I will not fear that any man should, that we should be bold, and we should not fear what man will do unto us, and that we remember those that have rule over us, and that we should follow them. And then all of a sudden, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And so we're just going to cover a couple of those points and give you a reminder of why Jesus is so important to us and to the Bible. I mean, basically, that is the plan of salvation is that, you know, He is the way, the truth, and the life. And today, there is an attack on Jesus Christ. There's an attack on the Word of God. There's an attack on the purity of the gospel, on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, I'm just going to go over a couple of points that stood out to me as I was studying this passage. And uh, the point of this is to remind us that even though there is no new thing under the sun, there's a couple of things that do stand out. Number one, you know, nothing changes in the sense that there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, if you read the first book of the Bible, Genesis, you'll find everything that we're experiencing now. It, it happened in all those 50 chapters. I mean, you know, uh, you have creation and then you have the fall of man and you have all kinds of sin and you have the flood and then you have man messing up again and you have the Tower of Babel and then you have, uh, you know, there's just all kinds of things that are standing out in the book of Genesis as you see uh, things going on. And, and, it, and if we, we were to study that and we look at today, it's all the same thing. You know, man is still in a fallen state. We're still condemned unto death if we don't have Jesus Christ. We still have uh, sin in our life. People are still doing uh, ima wicked imaginations. Uh, just today, there's an article that came out about how now the nuns are implicated in the Catholic Church, you know, as to all the evil that they've committed on children. Not just the priests, but the nuns as well, and how they've abused little girls and little boys, and how they've actually been uh, accomplices in the whole uh, debacle. Now, you know, for us that, that know that that's wicked, we, we believe that to be true, but, you know, many people probably thought the nuns were, were clean of that, and that's not the case. So uh, the point that I'm making here is that Nothing changes, and, and, but the things do change. The, the things that have to change are the spiritual, uh, spiritual things because the worldly things won't change. You know, we're all uh, born, we all live, and we all die. And in that process, we all are born, we all sin, and if we don't have Christ, we're going to die, and then we die into an eternal death. But if we have Christ, then He is the same yesterday and today and forever and just you know just to give you an illustration of how uh, there's constant change but there isn't it's a paradox of life is you know uh, you know when I learned the 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 theory of relativity a long time ago and I'm not going to go into a whole discourse and I'm probably gonna butcher it at some point but uh, one of the things that you learn is that nothing really is the same even though it is the same so for example I'm the same person I was a few hours ago but I'm no longer the same person I was a few hours ago. My body's deteriorated a little bit. My uh, molecular change, my biological body has changed somewhat. You know, if we look at this uh, pulpit right here, for us, that we can't view beyond the sub, uh, the subatomic or the, you know, we can't see the atoms and the particles in here and the protons and neutrons and all that. It just looks like a solid piece of wood, but in here there's constant change. There's constant movement. It's not the same pulpit it was a while ago. You say, well, where are you going with all this? Well, 
The one thing that we do know for sure, though, is that all of this is compromised of the matter that was created from the beginning. We cannot create anything new, and we cannot destroy any, any of the matter. We're just kind of recycling it, or it's, you know, just cycling through. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the Bible is true, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, and we have to then stand on those laurels because if not, if we believe that there's any change to what we preach, then it's all uh, for nothing. And so, the, you know, turn over to Galatians 3, uh, 22. Let's go over to Galatians, uh, the book of Galatians, and go to Galatians 3, uh, 22. And uh, we're going to be there in chapter 3, and we're going to be there in verse 22. We're going to go down to 29. And the very first thing that we realize is that sin hasn't changed. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the arguments I hear is, well, there was no sin, uh, you know, in when God created the world, you know, when God created Adam and Eve. And that's true. They were made, you know, they weren't sinful. But the minute that they partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were uh, condemned to death. And then sin came into the world. So the sin has been from the beginning. You know, the same thing, and, it, and it's been true and through all the way uh, throughout history, even to this day. If you look at Galatians 3, verse 22, it says, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So we see a couple of things here that stand out, that we're constantly preaching, and we're constantly uh, reinforcing into not only ourselves, but those that we are discipling and those that we uh, are trying to lead to Christ is that everybody's under sin, we're all sinful, and that we're all, uh, and the, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ to be, might be given to them that believe, that all we have to do is believe. It says, but before faith, in verse 23, came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after the, that faith has come, we no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have, been, have put on Christ. There is, neither, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promises. So we see sin, we see the belief, we see the belief is through Jesus Christ, and then we see that we are God's chosen people. We are the spiritual seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise that God uh, established from the beginning of the world. Then we, if we go to Matthew 12, verse 31, it says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. If you turn over to 1 Peter 1.18, uh, one of the things that we're going to see is that uh, Jesus was the sacrifice for this all along, you know, because the world does not change. The reason it doesn't change is because Jesus established it the way it should be. And he, there was a plan from the beginning. Now, you say, well, you know, he created Adam and Eve and he created the garden and everything was, uh, they hadn't sinned. Why was it that God uh, did that? Look, why is it that God did that? The Bible tells us that they, they fell, that they were deceived by the devil. That's just what I understand from the Bible. And it, the purpose was so that his son, uh, God's son, Jesus, could die on the cross and save us from all our sin for an eternal uh, redemption, for an eternal life. So if we go over to 1 Peter 1.18, Jesus, uh, and, and the point I have here is that Jesus was the sacrifice all along. If you go to 1 Peter 1.18, it says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition, from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, 
So it's consistent with Jesus was the same yesterday and today and forever, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass, and, and all the glory of, of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And where I'm going with this is that Jesus is part of the Trinity, but Jesus is the part that leads us to salvation. You know, you can't get to the Holy Spirit uh, or you can't uh, receive the Comforter if it's not through Jesus Christ. And you can't get to God the Father if it's not through Jesus Christ. You know, it says, foreordained before the foundation of the world. In other words, Jesus was the same yesterday and today and forever. And let's go over, uh, turn in your Bibles to 1 John 5, 6. Uh, while, I turn, while I read to you John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. See, the thing that changes is the corruptible, right? The corruptible decays. It's in a, in a constant uh, state of destruction or fading away or, you know, atrophy. It just constantly is, is withering away. But the incorruptible is forever. When we take on the incorruptible, the spirit is quickened for all eternity. Then eventually, when, we, when Jesus comes again and he gives us our new body, then we will take on the incorruptible body. Let's go to John 1.12. And how do we know that? Because the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Uh, I mean, you're in 1 John 5.6. Let me just read for you uh, 1 John I mean, John 1, 12, it says, Even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's important to know that we worship Jesus of the Bible specifically for the English-speaking people, the King James Bible, because if we don't understand that, we can, uh, we can easily fall into false doctrines. We can easily fall into misunderstanding of key uh, biblical scripture that will become a stumbling block to those who are looking to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's number one. But number two is it also will hinder us from growing in the word so that we can purge the iniquity from our life so that we can better serve the Lord and go out there and lead more souls to Christ and go out there and expand his kingdom if we don't understand these basic tenets. You know, First uh, John 5, 6 says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. So we have the witness in ourselves. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave us of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given, us, given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. See, what changes is the corruptible into the incorruptible. And once it's incorruptible, it's the same for all eternity. Uh, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. See, once we have eternal life, it's going to be the same life 
for all eternity. Now, uh, the Bible indicates and gives us some indication of things that will happen once we uh, go on into eternity. You know, that, that it, it's not just going to be this uh, frolicking around and playing harps and bouncing around on clouds, but the life is eternal. It's going to be uh, for, for as long as we can, I mean, we can't even wrap our minds around it, but why? Because why is that the case? Because Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. And then just real quick, you know, just so we can see where we get life, we need to understand that Jesus is life. And even in this life, he has given us our life. And, and, and I know I, I use that a lot, but it's because if you go to Genesis 2-7, and in the meantime, just your fingers there on Hebrews 13, we're going to be there. We're going to go back to verse 1. But in Genesis 2-7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So where did we get the breath of life? From God. And we know that back in Genesis 1, he says, let us make man in our image, you know, the Trinity. And so that's a very important tenet because one of the things that's going to occur as we come closer to the end, you know, as we refer to as the end times, as the Antichrist comes and the new world government or the new world order is established and everything comes to a head, is that the removal of the biblical Jesus will be key. You know, because it, they're going to worship a God. It's not the God of the Bible, but the worship of a God requires that it's one God that's not God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. See, without Jesus, then you can just uh, substitute it with anything that you want. And if you bring a, a, a man of power, of supernatural power that's given to him by the beast or by Satan, then people will worship that and they will... Uh, they will be drawn to that and then they will be deceived and there will be a great falling away. So we need to understand who Jesus is and not only do we need to understand it, then we need to reinforce it in our lives and in the lives of other people so that we will continuously stand for the faith, especially when trials and tribulations come. But let's move on um, and let's look at the next point. It says in Hebrews 13:1, let brotherly love continue. So that's how Hebrews 13, 1 starts, and it's love the fellow believer, right? And let's go to Romans 12, verse 9, and then the Bible tells us, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that, another word for abhor is hate. So in case people are always wondering if the Bible actually teaches hate, there's a good place where the Bible teaches hate. It's abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affectionate, one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. So leading up to the understanding of Jesus being the same yesterday and today and forever, he says, look, let brotherly love continue. Love your brothers in Christ. And sometimes, you know, we, we can butt heads with other brothers and sisters in Christ, but the Bible tells us that we need to love our brothers and that it, not only do we love them, but we should continue. Go to 1 Timothy 4, 8. And then, uh, actually, I'll read, go to 2 Peter 1, 3, and, and I'll read for you 1 Timothy 4, 8. I mean, uh, sorry, 1 first, uh, first Thessalonians first Th Thessalonians 4, 8. And you go to 2 Peter 1. The Bible says, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, Ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So who teaches us to love our brethren? God does. Well, how do we do that? We do that through the word, which the Bible refers to as Jesus Christ. So it's very important that we, we learn the word and we meditate on the word and we read the word because that's where we get our doctrine to learn how to love our brothers because he's the one that's going to teach us, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You know, go to 2 Peter 1, 3. The Bible says there, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to the glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption 
that is in the world through lust. So we have these exceeding great and precious promises, right? And beside this, giving all diligence to add to your faith, virtue, you know, the voluntary obedience of truth. So on our faith, we're going to be, we, we want to, after we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if we love the Lord, we want to voluntarily obey the truth. We want to, you know, follow his commandments. We want to do right. We want to let brotherly love continue. You know, we want to do these things because the Bible is instructing us to, and to virtue knowledge. And then we want to grow in the word and understand it and, and uh, glean off of it and grow and mature and, and teach others and learn and, and, and just uh, absorb it all. It says, and to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness. And that word temperance, you know, it's doing things in moderation. So we want to have moderation. And then that leads us to patience. You know, if you're not going to indulge in things, if you're not going to overindulge, that makes to make you patient, right? If, you, if you're on a diet and you're going to remove uh, certain foods from your life or you're going to be moderate in the way that you're in taking certain drinks or certain uh, meats or, or uh, desserts, you're going to do things in moderation. It requires patience because, you know, knowing that you can't reward yourself at the end of the week uh, if you mess up, you have to be patient that like, you know, if you've ever done a diet, I've done those where you have a diet and then you start on a Monday, you say, okay, well, I'm going to eat certain foods uh, Monday through Thursday and on Friday is a reward day. Well, you can't really reward yourself if you don't have the temperance to hold back on all the bad foods that you're planning on eating on Friday as a reward for being good the rest of the week. So we have to be able to, you know, be moderate in our temperance or to temperance patience and to patience godliness and verse 7 says and to godliness bro brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity and so the way do we the way to achieve charity you know like first corinthians 13 is through jesus christ but also in our flesh is to do these things i mean this is actually a great set of of instructions on how to be more loving, more charitable to people. You know, I mean, it says right here that we, we're, we're going to add virtue, right? And besides give it this, giving all diligence, we're going to add to your faith, virtue and virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor are, are, are unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So see, we're not going to be uh, vain. We're not going to be unfruitful when it comes to the word of God if we do these things. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. In other words, don't forget the work that God has done. I mean, you're once saved, always saved, but there is a danger of falling into complacency, into apathy, into being just lazy about the work of the Lord. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people, and the Bible alludes to that in Romans 4 and 5. I won't go there because I use that quite a bit, but that it's not necessary to work to get saved. Save, saved is uh, by faith alone in Jesus Christ, and once saved, always saved. And, you know, you're promised that eternal life, but you're not promised all the other things, the crowns and the, and the rewards in heaven if you don't do that work. But you can't get that without going through this process. You know, another thing is uh, over there in Hebrews 13, verse 3, we see prayer. It says, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. And for me, that's a, just a key point that the Bible's making, that we, when we bring people into remembrance, what's one way to do that when we're not with them? Is to pray for them. It's not just to think about them, you know, oh, so-and-so suffering, but it's also, or so-and-so is being persecuted, but to pray for them that God would do the work that is necessary through them, and to remind us that we could be in that position. It says, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. And so, 
you know, prayer is a very important part of our life. It's something that we should uh, attain to. And even though this is specifically saying uh, to pray for them, you know, if, if we're having brotherly love, if we're uh, in verse 2, and the reason I didn't touch a lot on verse 2, just to be not forgetful and entertain strangers, for, uh, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware, is, you know, uh, speaking on angels alone, that's a whole other sermon or set of sermons because you have, you know, angels uh, that, that are what we, imagine, what we know to be supernatural beings uh, or have, you know, specific uh, realm in the heavenly, in, in heaven, but there's also angels as in messengers of God that are men uh, of God, that are men like you and I that are just uh, angels. So we're not, uh, you know, and I, and I even now I got too sidetracked, but, you know, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some, some having entertained angels, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves in the body. So coming back to the point is, you know, a good way to do all of this is through prayer. See, how do you have brotherly love continue? You pray. You pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. You pray for the ministry. You pray for the laborers. Uh, you pray for the souls that are going to be one. You pray for the work that's being done. Not just the work that you're doing, but the work that others are doing, the effort that they're putting. Uh, and so we see here that as we remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. So let's see what the Bible tells us about praying for others. Let's go to Mark eleven twenty two, and it says, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, thou shalt no doubt in, in his heart, thou, uh, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatever, whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. So it's great if we pray for those that are suffering, for those that are bound, and we pray that God's work and God's will be done in them and through them. You know, that, that God would, uh, you know, do great things through that work that is being uh, uh, done through that tribulation, through that persecution, through that suffering. And, you know, we know if we're in the ministry long enough, we, we're constantly going to either be uh, in challenges ourselves or we're going to know brothers and sisters that are in challenges. And we should constantly pray for them. Go to Colossians 1, and then we're going to be back in Hebrews, but go to Colossians 1, and the Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. So let brotherly love continue. That's a, a continuance and always. And praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and ye knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And you know, this, this correlates well with what we read in 2 Peter 1. You know, and verse 10 says that ye might walk worthily, I mean, might walk worthy, of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with, the, with all might, according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, 
even the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so we should uh, attain to do these things so that people can see that Jesus of the Bible. So that people can be a witness to that, so we can be a witness, so that we can preach the gospel, so that we can lead others to Christ. Because a lot of people, you know, great example is uh, yesterday we went to dinner uh, as a family, and um, I met a guy, first of all, uh, uh, I did not know, and you know, I, I, I try to study as much as I can about the world and world culture and stuff, but you know, there's just things you're gonna miss. And I did not know that there was a country in Africa that uh, was solely uh, Spanish speaking. It's called Equatorial New Guinea. And the waiter came and his accent sounded like he had a, a Hispanic accent. And I said, you know, what part of, uh, of the world are you in? He said, Equatorial New Guinea. And you know, lo and behold, here comes my ignorance. And I said, oh, well, what part of, of, of the Hispanic world is that or Latin America? And he's like, well, no, actually it's in Africa. It's near Central Africa. And I said, oh, okay, great. I said, well, what language do they speak? I said, because your accent sounds a lot like a friend of mine who speaks uh, Spanish from one of the Caribbean countries. And he said, well, it's because the, the main language in our, in our country is Spanish. Anyways, I, I digressed a little, but it's a good start to the story. But, and I said, oh, okay, well, is it a part of the region that's more Muslim-based or more uh, you know, Christian-based? He's like, oh, no, we're more Christian, you know, and obviously, I, we hadn't gotten into the details of Safe by Grace. Obviously, there's false religions and false churches all over Africa, uh, all over the world, even here in the United States. So I'm not uh, picking on Africa at this point. I'm just making a point. And I started talking to him about it. You know, when was the last time you went to church or what church he goes to? And he goes, I haven't been in church in two years. And I said, oh, well, you know, you should come to our church. He goes, well, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to read the Bible, you know, because the Bible was written by man. And I said, well, how do you, how do you go to heaven? And he said, well, I go to heaven by the way that I believe I go to heaven. I said, well, the Bible says that, you know, the way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. He goes, yeah, that's if you believe that the word was written to God. We ended the conversation. Obviously, he was working, but I'm going to follow up and take him out to lunch. And, you know, God willing, pray that we can lead him to Christ. But the, the fact is that, you know, that's what we need is the prayer. Because if they don't understand the Jesus of the Bible, then you're going to fall into all kinds of of mistakes and all kinds of false religions and all kinds of false doctrine and then you end up thinking that your way is right there is a way that is right in his own eyes he thinks that his path is correct he thinks that the way he's doing things is correct and he thinks he knows better than God because somebody never you know even though he said he went to church nobody ever took the time to explain the Jesus of the Bible, that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so now he has this skewed view of what reality is and what it is to get to heaven and what hell should be. And since he doesn't understand that he's lost, then it's hard for him to be found. And so just pray that, you know, we can give him the gospel, but more importantly, pray that the churches that still believe in the God of the Bible, that still believe that it's one, uh, one, you know, that God, that Jesus Christ is the mediator and that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, that these churches would start to stand more on the complete, entire word of God so that it doesn't uh, confuse people and lead them down a path that will just lead to ultimately hell. Or for those that are saved, no rewards. I mean, how sad would it be that you know, you get to heaven and everybody's getting all kinds of crowns and rewards and you're just sitting there watching. I mean, I think about it, you know, in the context of like our worldly flesh and I, I just don't want to be that guy. I mean, I know I'm not going to get every reward and every crown. I mean, I, I got saved when I was 25, but I'd like to attain to something. And the Bible says, look, let brotherly love continue. Uh, don't forget to entertain strangers because, you know, you might be with angels and, you know, pray or don't remember those that are bound and, don't forget that you also suffer in an adversity. And then what's another thing that this all leads to? Look, when you first get saved, you know, you don't know what it, you don't know one way one way up from another because you're still learning the, the uh, you're still getting rid of the world, right? Um, at least in my experience. Let me just I, that that's actually a better statement. In my experience, I was 25 years old, and so I already had experienced a lot of the world. I was a young adult and you know, I had a lot of misconceptions about what life should be. You know, it wasn't until I started reading the Word and meditating on it that I started seeing what God had in store for me and my life and my future family. 
right? And the next verse says, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So another important thing is that marriage is established by God. It was established in the beginning, and it establishes the fact that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever because his law doesn't change. You know, just real quick, a 2016 Pew poll, uh, and, and I, I couldn't find a more current one, but it doesn't matter. We know that numbers are probably higher. It says that 74% of so-called Christians are separated or divorced. Why is that? Because we're not preaching the Jesus of the Bible. You know, if you turn to Mark 10, turn to Mark 10 and go to verse 1, it says uh, in Mark 10, verse 1, it says, And he arose from thence, and cometh into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan, and the people resort unto him again. And as he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And there, this is the Pharisees talking to Jesus. And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered or allowed to write a bill to the divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. In other words, for you 74% and claim to be Christian, for your hardness, this is why you're divorcing. It says, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the uh, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And in this house, and in, and in the house, his disciples asked him again of the same manner. And he said unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another, committeth adultery against her. And if a woman should put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. And I mean, there's countless verses that we could point to about marriage, but this is a really strong one because where, how was it from the beginning? God hates divorce. God hates divorce. And so verses leading up to Jesus, the same yesterday and today and forever, he's talking about marriage. And that's a very important doctrine and principle in our lives because we believe that it's forever. Once married, always married. Kind of like once saved, always saved. You know, and I think that if we understood this better, you know, people wouldn't be so unhappy. I know couples that, uh, you know, they get older and they're like, you know, we just don't love each other anymore and, and I think we should get divorced. And they ask me what I think and, and I told them, look, I'm not a marriage counselor, but I can tell you that God does not condone divorce. You know, and as a wife, you should be submissive to your husband. And as a husband, you should lead your wife. But the challenge is that instead of focusing on what God said and being content with that, what they focus on is whatever negative thing that they can point about the spouse, about each other. Well, look, pointing out negative things in each other is very easy. I mean, if you sat down with my wife long enough, she'd tell you, she could give you a laundry list of things that, you know, I probably do wrong. But the reason that, that we don't focus on us because God told us that it's forever, that we should never divorce. So our goal is to not divorce, period. So you know what it does is it allows us to work through our challenges much better, you know, because we're going to search the word and we're going to search scripture for how we should react or respond to certain situations in our married life. You know, the next point is go to Hebrews 13, 5. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness. I mean, covetousness is you don't want your neighbors anything. And be content with such, such things as ye have. For he saith, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And the next point is, is I actually just titled it, Once Saved, Always Saved. Because the Bible tells us that, look, he says he's never going to leave us, nor forsake us. So it's interesting how he ties that right here. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness. In other words, don't be envious of anything else and be content with such things as you have well how are you content with such uh, with such things as you have when you have jesus christ who's the same yesterday and today and forever then you know that he's never going to leave you nor forsake you so then it's easy for you not to want to covet anything else you know if if you lose your job 
and you, but you have faith in Jesus Christ, then you know he's never going to leave you and forsake you. If you run into a, a challenge with your spouse, then you're content with whatever things he's giving you because you know he's never going to leave you nor forsake you. If, uh, you know, if you have a trial or a tribulation that you're facing or there's a challenge in your life and, uh, or you look at somebody else's life or somebody else's ministry, for example, and you say, man, they're really doing these big things. Or, you know, the Bible says don't covet. Just be content with what you're doing because he's never going to leave you nor forsake you. Well, the only way that God can't leave you nor forsake you is because you have the blood of Jesus Christ, you know, on you. Because he's cleansed you from all sin. Because he's imputed his righteousness unto you. You know, so let's keep moving on right here so we can just close this out. Go to Hebrews 13, 6. The Bible says, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So when we have all these things, oh, I, and I'm sorry, uh, I got ahead of myself. You know, I, I got excited with the one saved, always saved. That's, that's probably the, the best thing about uh, being saved. But go, go to Philippians 4.10 real quick. Philippians 4.10. You know, and I'll turn there with you to slow myself down a little bit. Uh, so that's what happens when you read it all from the notes. But go to Philippians 4.10. And let's just read uh, a few verses on contentment. I just, my, my brain just totally skipped over that. But let's go to 4.10. It says, but I rejoice. And by the way, I'm content in the fact that even though I make mistakes, I'm able to preach the word of God. And so by, the Bible says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished. Again, wherein ye also are careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want or covetousness, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You know, we use that, uh, or modern Christianity loves to use that verse. And, and, and they kind of have taken some of the, the strength of that meaning. And what I like to do is bring it back. You know, if we look to Jesus Christ and we understand the, the importance of how he's the same yesterday and today and forever, and we see that his word is unchangeable and it's uncorruptible and it was not written by man, but it was inspired by God and it was penned by men through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, then we know that we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. You know, it gives us that uh, ability to stay married. It gives us that ability to have brotherly love. It gives us that ability to entertain strangers. You know, it gives us that ability to do those things, to, uh, to remember those that are bound, to remember that we will suffer adversity. It gives us that ability to stay focused on those things. Go to Hebrews 13, 6 now. Now we can get back on track and read there in verse 6. And while you're reading there, uh, just turn your fingers over to Ephesians 6. It says, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. See, we know if he never leaves us nor forsakes us, and if we're focused on Jesus Christ, then he's going to make us bold, and we can say, he is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Go to Ephesians 6, and uh, verse 18. Ephesians 6, verse 18 Ephesians 6, verse 18, and we see uh, there in verse 18, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So, through prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching there unto all perseverance and supplication for all saints. See, we're remembering the, the saints. It says, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly. So, pray for me that 
utterance may be given to me, that I may speak boldly. And I'll pray for you, and we should pray for our, all, all our brothers and sisters in Christ in the world, especially those that we know, that they may speak boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. In other words, translation, uh, let's pray for everybody to go soul winning. And let's pray for more soul winners. And let's pray for more laborers and more warriors in Christ so that we can go out there and make the mystery of the gospel known to them for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You know, and then uh, go back to Hebrews 13, verse 7, and we're going to close this out leading up to verse 8. You know, I'm just going to focus on those first eight, uh, eight verses of Hebrews 13. And the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 7, it says, Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And the Bible instructs us to follow those who led us and who lead us in, in this. In other words, for example, here at Springcrest, I follow Pastor Cobb. But then there's also bro other brothers in Christ throughout the country that we follow, right? Remember them that have, and, that, and then it says, remember them that have rule over you. Well, your pastor has rule over you in the church. You know, your husband, wives, has rule over you in the home. Your mother and father have rule over you in, in your home, children. You know, it says, remember them that rule over you. have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation and let's go to first timothy 6 11 and just close this out uh close this uh close these points out and then we'll come back uh to the final statement but first timothy 6 verse 11 through 14 says but thou o man of god flee these things and follow after righteousness so what should we flee flee you know the sins of the world you know the temptations of the world it says and follow after righteousness Godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. It says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. So Jesus Christ has to be the same yesterday and today and forever for us to be able to fight the good fight and to lay hold onto eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. And so, Paul's given Timothy charge to preach the gospel, to fight a good fight, to lay hold on to the eternal. You know what? When we hold on to the eternal, when we fall more in love with Jesus, when we fall more in love with the Word of God, guess what we can do? We're not only going to lay hold on to the eternals, and we're reminding ourselves that we're once saved, always saved, but we're able to then tell others of that free gift and we're able to be just more fruitful. You know, we're able to be more succinct. We're able to be more powerful when we're out there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, you know, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. You know, salvation was just uh, was the same in the Old Testament as it was in the New Testament. Uh, the law was there to remind us that we're sinners. That God wants us to, you know, continue in brotherly love. God wants us to not to forget to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. He wants us to remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. And them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. He wants us to know that marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, meaning that we're going to stay married. Because, see, if you're married, you can't defile that bed. It's when you commit adultery or fornication that you undefile. But it says, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. You know, he wants us to be uh, content with such things as we have because he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. And then he wants us to be bold knowing that he is our helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And then he wants us to remember those that have rule over us but specifically who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. See, what's the end of, uh, of someone whose faith you follow, the end of their conversation? You know, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we get to verse 8, and it says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And now I can touch a little bit on the other verses. 
because this is where the why it's so important because we're setting up the foundation so that we're not verse 9 be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace not with meats which have profited them that have been occupied uh, therein and so we see that immediately if we're not with Jesus if we're not understanding the Jesus of the Bible you know, the, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Go out there and baptize them in the name of the Son. I mean, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then all of a sudden, we're carried about with divers and strange doctrines. And, and you see that even today. You know, I was talking earlier this morning, and I'll close out with that, where there's churches, Baptist churches, that if we went over to their church, we'd probably fit in. If I were to ask them to give me their gospel presentation, we'd agree that it, you know it's through faith and it's eternal and you can't lose it it's once saved always saved but then when they're preaching the word of god they're afraid to preach the entire truth and so then they confuse the issue and the danger is twofold the danger number one to close this out is for those that are saved again and i'm going to repeat is that then then you get carried away with divers and strange doctrines but the the most dangerous actually is the second one that when we get carried away with divers and strange doctrines then we become a stumbling, uh, a stumbling block. We become a wall or we become a, a, a muddy filter for the Word of God. And then what it does is it, it impedes others that are looking or that God is drawing nigh to receive the gospel because we're not preaching the pure, unfiltered Word of God. And the way that that starts is to recognize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that he is the same yesterday, uh, yesterday and today and forever. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today and the opportunity to just preach this message. Thank you for the reminder in your word of the things that are true. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here, Lord, and thank you for the opportunity to also be content uh, when mistakes happen and uh, you get a little tongue-tied or, or uh, tripped up in, in the messages. But Lord, more importantly than that, you know, it doesn't matter how many mistakes I make or how I, I'm, I mess up. What matters is that I'm preaching the Word and that those that are listening take the Word and that they apply it to their lives and that they use it to edify and that they lay their foundation on, a, on the rock, that rock being Jesus Christ. So, Lord, just help us to remember that consistently, to drive it home, to be repetitive about it, to just kind of continuously build all our doctrine, all our life, all our meditation, all our reading, all our decisions on Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.